So this morning we want to talk about the true success of our life. We have different concepts about success. And I want to begin with a, with a prayer. A prayer that Paul prayed to the church, toward the church of the Thessalonians. You know, the Thessalonians were a young church. They were just growing. And they went through a lot of persecutions and hardship as even from the very beginning when they believed in the Lord. Did you know that there are 14 prayers in the two short letters of Thessalonians? That's a lot. And that indicates to you Paul great, Paul's great concern for the church. 14 prayers in just a few chapters of, of the Bible. And through his prayer, we can understand Paul's concern, his heart, uh, you know, what, what he wished for them. And Paul never writes to them... <coughs> I pray that your persecution will end soon because they were being persecuted. That's not what he prayed for. He didn't pray about the persecution. He prayed that they will remain focused on the, on the growth of their maturity, that they will become uh, stronger. He prayed that their way of life will glorify God, that their way of life will advance the gospel. That's what Paul is concerned with. And that prayer is for you this morning. Do you agree with this? Yes? Okay, some of you agree. I hope that many of you will agree eventually when we read the prayer on the next slide. Therefore, we also pray always for you that our God will count you worthy of his calling and fulfill all the good pleasures <coughs> of his goodness and the work of faith with power, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you. <coughs> and you and him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. What a wonderful prayer for us. And also it, it connects with the title of the message today, the true success of our life. You may have any achievement, you may be the greatest, the richest, the whatever achievement you may have, the most important and the only thing that will count at the end is that God count you worthy of his calling that at the end you will be counted worthy and actually if you look at this letter the context of this prayer you will see that it is a, in the context of the lord's return when the lord's return at the sound of the trumpet when he comes with flaming uh, fire to to judge and punish the unbelievers and to be acclaimed by his people and then the prayer comes immediately in that, in that context. So that our God would count you worthy is an expression to evaluate your service, your life, your walk with God, but in, in w keeping in mind the judgment to come in view of the judgment that God may count your life worthy of the calling. Living worthy of our calling is a concept that Paul used a lot in his letters as well. So it's very, very important for us. If you remember not too long ago, Pastor Jennifer even talked about it, the worthy of his calling, and she used the terminology of a, of a weight, a scale, to measure up. You have the... the, the the greatness of the calling of God, and then you have your life. How, how does it stand in the balance? Is that really worthy of the calling? Is your life as, as the same weight as, as the, the worthiness of the calling of the Lord? Hallelujah. But what attracts my heart this morning to that is the part where it says that you and I, by God's mighty power, we will be enabled to fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness. That's quite a sentence. This is a very em emphatic sentence that we have there. The fullness, the good pleasure, of the goodness of God to fulfill that. What is the good pleasure of our Father? The good pleasure of our Father, we have already received it, our salvation. But the goodness of the Lord is extended to all mankind as well, so that you and I, we will be uh, used by the Lord, empowered, enabled to be instrument used to fulfill the good pleasure of the Lord, of His goodness toward mankind. So that means that you and I, we have a very active calling in the Lord. We should not be passive. Okay, I'm saved now, so I'm okay. Oh, my family, we have a Christian family, we go to church, so oh, we are okay. 
Yes, we are okay, but there is a, a, a worthy calling, a high calling, and we are called and w God promised that he will enable us, make us able to fulfill the good pleasures of his goodness to mankind. So you are walking goodness. You are, you are uh, meant to, to, to go into actions of goodness, to reveal the goodness of the Lord. This world has no other way to see the goodness of the Lord than by you and me, through acts of goodness, through your ministry of love, through forgiveness, through loving one another, that the, the Bible tells us a lot to love our neighbors and things like this. So we are to be an expression of the Lord's goodness. That's a high calling, don't you think so? Yes? Yeah. So that is the prayer of Paul. That is a great prayer for you and for me. And a reminder at the same time that, okay, and a, and a way to measure and evaluate at the same time. Am I worthy of that? Am I part of revealing God's goodness? Am I walking as an instrument to reveal the good pleasure of the Lord? First of all, do I feel the good pleasure of the Lord in my heart? Do I f know that? Am I aware that I have this, this, this uh, calling in my life? So that prayer is for all people, for all Christians. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. And this can only take place by the grace of our Lord and by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's only the grace of the Lord that will enable us. So I want to start with that to switch to the Father's Day message because this is part of a call that is not limited to fathers. It's not limited to parents. It's to every Christian. But we will emphasize, since it is uh, Father's Day today, we will emphasize parenting, the father's role. But, but I want you to, to go beyond so that nobody is left out of this message because it's a call to all Christian to be instruments to fulfill God's good pleasure of all his goodness. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Do you agree with this? Yes, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So the prayer of Paul applies to fathers, mothers, and to every one of us. So today we should honor Christian parents because of the great important role that you have. But also everybody that is involved in touching and influencing uh, uh, children. It may be your, your, your nephew or niece. It may be children of the Sunday school. This morning in the second service, probably all of these children will be coming, Nepalese and uh, other children will come from very poor families and very uh, troubled family. So they need to receive the goodness of the Lord when they walk into this place here today. Anybody that should walk in this place, especially inside, but as you go outside, they should be able to see the goodness of the Lord. There are many examples in the Bible of good and not so good parents, because you can learn from good parents, and you can learn from not so good parents also, and learn some, some principle from the Bible. Some of them are like Enoch, who walked with the Lord, and we know that he was a parent. Abraham who was given the title the father of all of those who believe or father the, those who walk in the faith and how he trained his children uh, Isaac and Jacob hallelujah Joshua who was the uh, one who trusted God when nobody else would trust the Lord and he didn't care at the end of his life what other fathers would do what was the trend of his society as for me and my family in my household we will serve the Lord we, I'm thinking of David and Solomon. Think about uh, little Solomon. How many times Solomon refers to my father David after the great influence of his father. And if you, you will notice that uh, Solomon, as his father, we, we enjoy the book of the Psalms, the poetry of the Psalms, the, the, the prayers from David's heart. But then if you look in this Solomon's life, you will see a lot of writings, a lot of poetry also. He wrote Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs. So where did he learn to, to do all of these things? And why do, does he mention his father so much in his life? Because because he had the positive influence and the spiritual influence as well on him. Some fathers have done good in certain areas and not so good and fail in other areas. Think of Eli the priest, for instance, who, who, who failed concerning his own children 
and the Lord judged him and rebuked him and his family. But at the same time, the same man led young Samuel to discover the voice of the Lord and to become sensitive to the Holy Spirit because even though he was weak toward uh, raising his own children, he remained sensitive to the Lord and submissive and he was able to recognize the word of the Lord. When the prophet came to him at the end of his life, even though he failed in raising his own children, he was submissive to the judgment and he recognized that this prophet was talking about God. So he always retained that sensitivity to God's voice. And uh, so this is an example of a man who put his family first. And uh, this is a characteristic that now mark many modern Christian families, to put children above anything else. Children becomes the, 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 the heart of the family, the, the motivation of the family. They make decisions that adults should be made. Which restaurant, what food, what activities. They influence the mood of the family. If the children are not happy, the whole family is not happy. If the children want something, the all children, mother and father, mother with grandmother will follow the child with a spoon instead of sit that child on the table. The child become today the, the king, the queen, the emperor of, of the family. So, so we recognize some of the things that uh, uh, Eli has done toward his children and in this modern society. And I want to refer here to um, a message from Francis Chan, who wrote to uh, modern uh, parents. Francis Chan is a worldwide known, renowned speaker, uh, very, very important, wrote many books, is a great man of God. He explained how modern Christian parents idolize their own families and forsake at the same time the mission of God, which is the worst things. I mean to, to love our children, yes. To take care of our children the best we can, yes to all of that. But at the same time, where is God in all of this? Does he come second? Jesus said, and this is a word that I received when I was uh, asking questions to God about my calling in my ministry in 1993 when I was in Canada wondering if I should come back to continue my mission work in Hong Kong or just return to Canada when I was in the midst of a, a crisis with my own family. And one word that the Lord says, if you love your children more than me, you are not worthy of me. Because I was struggling about the children or the will of the Lord. And the Lord encouraged me and he told me, uh, when I say he told me, he really did tell me. I, I, was, I was fasting and I was praying and seeking the Lord's uh, direction for my life. And the Lord says, do like Abraham, bring your children on the mountain and let me handle them. So I made a decision in my life. But here we, we read from uh, Francis Chance that many uh, Christian parents, modern Christian families, because they put their children so much, the protections, the comfort, the, the, all the, the well-being, which is good and is good before the Lord. And when these same Christian parents, many of them were single, they were on fire. Many of them answered altar call. Many of them pledged, Lord, use me, whatever you call me to do, wherever you want me to go, I will do it. And this, I knew this kind of Christians. I have prayed with these young people. I used to be a youth pastor. So I, I, I'm, I'm getting older now. So I've seen many, many children. Many of my youth now are parents of, of uh, teenagers and young adults and married children. So I know what the, the people are capable of doing. They prayed. They offered themselves for the mission of the Lord and they have never stepped a foot uh, uh, in, in the mission of the Lord. They have never done the, the, the things that they had prayed and they felt that the Lord has called them. Many, many Christians, unfortunately, God calls me. God told me. God called me to do this. God called me to go to China. God told me to do to here, there, or to, to do uh, missions with, with my skills and uh, my professions and they are not going to they are going to think only of their family first and maybe at the end when they will grow older they think that they will be able to do that but it doesn't work because when God calls you need to be crazy enough and an extremist enough to step in when the Lord calls when the Lord visit when the Lord knocks at the door of the heart it's the time to reply not not when later yes the Lord called me but I will do it in 30 years 
or in 25 years when my, all my children are, have finished their, their studies at university. I'm sorry, but I don't think it's worth like that in the kingdom of God. However, when these parents who were willing to be radical for the mission of God, when they get married, they forsake their desire of for God and focus only on their family. And Francis Chan uh, says their families become like idols to them because God has taken the second, the second place in their, in their life. The mentality usually goes, put your children first when they are young and when they will be old enough, then you can go back to ministry. So that is putting children before the Lord. And many Christian parents practice that W not even being aware that this is the lifestyle that they, they have. So Francis Chan continues claiming that as children grow, they don't see anything alive and supernatural in the life of faith of their parents. There's not this connection of faith in the life and the family because their parents have lowered their standards. They are not they have forsaken God for a, for a number of years. Of course, they are religious. They do things. But the supernatural, the adventure of faith, the exciting uh, of, of the scriptures, they are not experiencing in the family the, the Holy Spirit, the supernatural. So that is a bit sad. So many are unaware of it. And our children should not be a substitute for serving the Lord. Hallelujah. I don't know if you agree with me, but I agree with myself. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Many modern Christians seem to have forgotten something that every Christian is called to serving the Lord. With children, without children, it doesn't matter. Bring your children with you. Go on the mountain. Go in the mission. Go in whatever. Bring your children. Let them, let them see. Let them experience. Let them experience the hardship. Let them experience the, the the, the living by faith, the, the believing and the receiving the Lord. When, when you pray for something and it happens. I remember one time gathering my children. We were, we were very poor. We, we were doing homeschooling and we needed our children to go to another type of school in Hong Kong. And I did not have the resources. I did not have the, anything to, to make it happen. So I was honest with my children. I gathered my children, my wife, we sat in the living room. I remember it very much. I says, you know, let's pray because you know dad cannot make it happen. I cannot do anything. I, we don't have money. You know, on Sunday afternoon after lunch, when all of our missionary friends used to go to different restaurants, we would go home because we didn't have money to go to the restaurant. That's how poor we were at the, these, these early years. We would live just like with the bare minimum, bare minimum. And then we prayed with our children. It says, okay, if the Lord provides, then you can go to an international school, but I certainly cannot. Anyway, that's a long story with a lot of details. And it didn't work. The second time I called the children again, I said, let's pray again. The second time it worked. And then anyway, the, the Lord opened the door. And the, the, the end story of that is funny because the school gave us financial assistance. I received money from unknown sources from Canada and America at the same time. And I had pledged an um, amount to, to give to the school because what the school was giving me as a, as a financial discount was not enough for me. I, I had zero. So even if you give me 50%, 50% I still cannot pay it. So, so they, they told me, okay, write back to us with your budget how much you can offer to us. And then I offered, it's ridiculous, 10% for the two children of the, 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 the fees of the school. This is an impossibility. But they accepted that. But the worst thing is that the 10% I did not even have. I, I pledged it by faith. And the 10% came by mail when it came. So at the end, our, my family needs were being met. I was not richer in my bank account or in my wallet, and I was not poorer, but the fa my family's needs were met. And I have experienced over the years so many times this kind of miraculous divine interventions in front of the children because we had prayed for that. And sometimes I remind, I remind them of, of that. But this morning I want to look at Noah. Because Noah is such an important testimony. He's one of the heroes of faith. 
and he is a very great person when it comes to being a, a father. Hallelujah. He has a special role in history. Noah is an example of a good father. We normally think of him as the guy who built the ark. And that is, uh, wait a minute, wait for me. When, uh, uh, when we talk of uh, Noah, we, th we think of him as the man who built the ark, which is a great achievement. But his greatest achievement is not only in the ark. It's in the result of his faith and of his walk with the Lord. That is the salvation of his children. Noe was concerned about his family. He taught them about righteousness by walking with God in righteousness. And by leaving a great example, he obeyed the Lord. He was consistent. He preached righteousness. And we will see all of these scriptures coming uh, next. Uh, how did Noah succeed? Six. Uh, uh, I will read verse 5 first to give a context. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and the, every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Noah raised a family in a difficult time. Just like you can claim today that it is very difficult, and indeed it is true that in this generation it is hard to raise a family. Look at verse 6 to 11. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the GNLG of Noah. Noah was a righteous man. I will read it here because my version here is a little bit different. Noah was a righteous man, the only blameless person living on earth at the time. And he walked in close fellowship with God. Noah was the father of three sons. Now God saw that the earth had become corrupt and was filled with violence. There was a horrible time to be a parent. It was the worst time just like today. Very filthy situation, immoral situation, with lots of temptation, lots of uh, contradictions and opposition against Christian family. But Noah, nevertheless, remained a righteous man. And here the word righteous, and that context here, is not only uh, being justified by faith, Though we will see in the next uh, slide later that he did get justified by faith. But it is his way of life, his uprightness. He lived honestly. He lived like a moral person. He did what was uh, uh, like a man of integrity. That is the, the righteous that we place. He was blameless, the only blameless. The word some Bible version use perfect. Some per Bible says uh, mature, complete. So this is, uh, he lived morally and clean and a filthy word. Like Noah, you and I, we live in a world filled with evil. So are we going to be influenced by this world, or are we going to be like Noah? So that's the question. So we learn more about Noah's righteousness in the next slide, in Hebrew chapter 11, verse 7, which is the chapter of the heroes of faith. We will see that Noah is really a man of faith. By faith, Noah, when warned about things yet not seen, things that had never appeared, not not. not not able to understand. We've never seen something like that. It never happened in this, in this world. And holy fear. He built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became what? Heir of, heir of righteousness that comes by faith. So we know now that he also obtained righteousness, justification, that through his faith, God made them, declared them righteous and all this. So we know that he did this. He says that he respected the warning. There was a warning, but a warning that didn't make sense. A warning of what? Build an ark? What is that? Building an ark. What is an ark? Why? Water? A flood? A deluge? Why? What is that? It never happened before. It never rained on the earth at that time before. So, so Noah became an heir of righteousness. That means that he received it freely. Uh, when you are an heir, you inherit something. You did not work for it. You received it from the Lord because of his, of his faith. Noah looked around at the immorality of his day, and he refused to follow the trend of his culture. Now, if you and I, we are going to walk with intimacy with the Lord, we have to be able to uh, let somebody lead. If you and I walk together, you want to go this way, I want to go this way, one of the two of us need to be right, and the other one needs to follow. So who is going to lead this, this new match, this unity, this walking together? Uh, 
It has to be, it has to be God, of course. That will. So to walk with God is to walk in His ways, is to follow His instructions, is to obey what He says in His word. So whoever you are, whether you are parents, father this morning, or, or anybody else, do you have a time in God's word every single day? Are you seeking that leading, that intimate instructions, that uh, spirit of revelation, the corrections, the, to be reoriented as the Lord wants you to do? This is what you will need to do if you want to walk with the Lord. Amen? Amen. Something interesting says, we read that God warned him about things that never happened before. If you don't walk in intimacy, you cannot hear that kind of revelation. You cannot be warned about something. You will not listen. You will not hear. You are not uh, in, in a state of being able to hear God's word warning you. And even less of something that never happened before says, wow, what is that? I don't understand. So in order to understand the revelation, he says, and holy fear. He respected the warning. He took heed at the warning. So that's something very important. Number three, Noah obeyed the Lord. If you, uh, when he says uh, in, in chapter 6, 13, says he was to destroy all flesh with the earth. And in verse 14 of Genesis, make yourself an ark. An ark? What for? What is that? For behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth and I will destroy all flesh. It never happened. But he did it in obedience and holy fear. God commands us sometimes as parents, as leaders, as Christians to do things, to speak up things, to, to behave in a certain manner, to take a position that will not be easy. It never happened before. I've never done that before. I've never been in that position before. I never had to, to, to um, with, withhold such an, uh, oppositions or some aggressiveness from other people or uh, opportunities for compromise. I've never been put in that situation before. But God says, you do it because you're mine. I want you to be able to fulfill all the pleasures about goodness. I want you to exhaust the work of your faith by the power that is in you. So many, many simple things that parents can do don't work on Sunday. Bring your family to church instead of sports of studies. Give generously. Serve the Lord. Tell the truth. Tell others about your faith. These are simple instructions in the word of the Lord. Go to the next slide. Genesis chapter 7 verse 1. Come into the ark, you and all of your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. Let's walk with God with passions and righteousness. Be the spiritual leaders of, of our homes and be consistent and obedient uh, w as we walk with, with the Lord. Because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. Noah also witnessed to other people. And that is part of our calling as well. Compare God's descriptions of Noah to his neighbors. They were all sinful, evil, wicked, evil intention. And Peter says in this text here that Noah, God did not spare the ancient world except for Noah and the seven other and his family. Noah, a preacher of righteousness, warned the world of God's righteous judgment. So God protected Noah when he destroyed the world of ungodly people with a vast flood. You have, you have this, this wonderful text here. He was a preacher of righteousness. He preached for 120 years. The flood came when he was 600 years old. So he had a long life to obey the Lord. You know, sometimes we may o o obey the Lord for, uh, you know, a few years when we are fresh and we've been touched by the Holy Spirit. But are you, are you going to, to obey the Lord for 600 years? You know, are you going to walk? Are you going to preach to unbelievers that uh, mock you and reject you for 120 years without gaining even one, one, one convert except your own children? That's what Do Jonah did, uh, Noah did. He, he was amazing, isn't it? That's why he's, he's among the heroes of faith. Noah warned others of their sin. He called them to repent. He called them of the judgment to come. They didn't want to listen. They were all judged and destroyed at the end. 
how discouraging this must have been for Noah. But he stayed true to the, the work that God has given him. He built his heart. His, his actions was a display of God's uh, pleasure. He did what God called him to do. So let me ask you, are you a witness for Christ? In the same way as Noah, do you invite others to church? It's a simple thing. It's not difficult to hear the gospel. Do you tell others about Christ's love and how they can have their sins forgiven? Do you share with them how they can have eternal life? I've, when is it the last time you told somebody that there would be a judgment coming in this world? And very soon, and very soon. Well, you say nobody wants to hear about it. True. Nobody wants to hear it. That, true and not true. It's not true. There's most likely someone who is seeking. Someone. So we, we, we often meet with divine appointment and opportunities. As I said in the message not too long ago, if we are ready. If, if you are intentional and you are ready and you, and you start your week on Monday morning and say, Lord, this week. Lord, give me the grace. Bring someone on my way that is seeking for you. Let me speak of you to this week to someone. If you start on Monday morning, I guarantee you that week you will find somebody to speak about the Lord. Because you have been intentional, your mind has been ready. So when this opportunity came, you, you, you see opportunities. You're ready for opportunities. But instead, if many say nobody wants to hear about it because that's what they see. That's the, the state of readiness of their heart. They, they are not ready. Nobody wanted to hear Noah also, but it didn't stop him to preach. Amen? Amen. Next, Noah won his family. Genesis 7, verse 5 to 7. Noah did everything as the Lord commanded him. Noah was 600 years old when the flood covered the earth. He went on board the boat to escape the flood, he and his wife and his sons and their wives. God wiped out every living thing on the earth. All were destroyed. The only people who survived were Noah and those with him in the boat. That is what happened. He was not a big businessman. He was not doing a lot of success according to the world. But he was a great role model and a good father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it is in our day. It's tough to be a parent. It's tough to live in this world. It's tough to be a Christian. It's tough to go to work every day in our life. It's a time of wickedness, violence, and sin. But is there God's grace enough in our lives? Can we do it successfully? Can we walk with God in our daily life in a wicked world, in a dark world? with success yes we can because God's grace is there but let me just add another warning that comes from Jesus himself in the next uh, slide because just as it was in the days of Noah so it will be when the Son of Man comes and this is a very stern warning to us and a, a wake-up call in those days before the flood people were eating and drinking partying, marrying, giving in marriage, right up to the day when Noah went into the ark. They were unaware of what was happening until the flood came and swept all of them away. That's how it will be when the Son of Man comes. And that is a calling to all of us to be ready. I believe this text is very, very important to us right now in our lives. And that makes me think of my children. It makes me think of people around me. It makes me think of unsafe people that I meet all the time. They were unaware of what was happening until the flood came and swept all of them away. And I have received a high calling in the Lord. Is everybody in around you? If you are a dad, a parent, or any Christian, are you living before people and living before your family the life of a spiritual man? The life of a man of God setting the example? Can your sons and daughters see Christ in you when you are at home? Is it real to you? Hallelujah. Yes, it is hard to raise children today. 
it is very hard to live as a Christian in this, as it always has been. Because sometimes we think it's harder now. And in some ways, I think it is harder. If I look at what the parents have, have to go today compared to when I was even a few years ago, I think it's, there are some elements that is harder uh, in, in some ways. But basically, the heart of man is the same. The need of man is the same. The power of God remains the same. The wickedness of the world. When you read that in the time of Noah, the, the, the descriptions of their time is not different than the descriptions of our time. I mean, it has different clothes, different hairstyles, uh, different behavior maybe, I don't know. But it's the same God that we serve and we have the same, the same calling and the same power of God. I want to finish with the last uh, verse uh, here on the, go next, next slide. That is our closing uh, slide. What is true success? So we tell others about Christ. There's a part here warning everyone, teaching everyone. We want to present them to God, perfect or blameless in their relationship to Christ. That's why I work and struggle so hard, depending on Christ's mighty work that works in me. So there's some, it looks like there's a contradiction in the last part of this verse. I, I struggle, it's like me, I, I struggle, it's, it's me doing it, it's me working. But at the same time it says that I depend upon the mighty work of the Lord that is working in me. If it is only me working and trying to make a difference in this world, I'll get tired, I'll run out of energy, I'll quit, I won't be able to be successful. Because true success is to be able to make it all the way. And here it says, because we depend on the mighty power that works in me, I can do that. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Are we ready to live like that? Jesus is coming, the world is lost, and God is calling each one of us, parents, father, Christians, to fulfill his good pleasure of, his good, his good pleasure, uh, that's what he's calling us. And he has promised the power of his Holy Spirit. There are more parents that we could look at in the Bible. The prodigal son is an inspiring story because he has a prodigal son, the, the father, the prodigal son. And some, some parents here, maybe we have some prodigal in our families. And we need to be like him and reminded of his constant love. He was thinking of his, he was praying for some, and when he came, he accepted him open arm. He, he did not nag them, he did not rebuke them, he just accepted him. Jacob and Joseph is another wonderful example of, of Joseph. You know, Joseph had a dream. At first, Jacob didn't like it. He got angry. But it says in the Bible that he kept the dream of his son and his heart. He cherished this. And, uh, you know, as Sunday school teachers, as we work with young children or your nephew and niece or young people that you have around your own children, can we believe that God may reveal himself supernaturally to these children? You see, God is able and God must reveal himself supernaturally to the, these children so that when they will come in their teenage years they will have uh, an, uh, they will have been impacted by the power of God they will have received uh, revelation have been touched supernaturally and for that you need to create an atmosphere of faith in your home and your life around you and the, your way of life you know unfortunately many parents when they, they criticize they talk negative they talk against their neighbors they may talk against the church they may express their anger they may think and that's not creating an atmosphere of faith you're christian and then what you bring filth you you bring anger you bring disappointment you bring you know trash into your home instead of bringing faith and uh, positive words you have Jesus and, and Joseph is his is father. Joseph was a carpenter. Jesus was a carpenter. He learned from him. And though, learned something. Joseph was not, Jesus was not flesh and blood of Joseph. It's like a, a reconstituted family or an adopted son. It was like a step son in, in a way today. If we put it in modern time today, it's like, 
there are so many of that in today's world. You know, remarried, broken, divorced, and then then they, they inherit another child or they adopt the child. And this is this is J Joseph and Jesus kind of model type. Joseph was so good with his adopted son or his stepson. He taught him to be a carpenter. He taught him a lot of things about, he was a righteous man, he was a good man. He, he, he received a revelation from the angel, he dreamed uh, dreams from God. So he was a, a godly man. So Jesus saw from his father something really, really good. So we need to be able to, whether we have stepchildren or adopted children, that we can influence the children that God entrusted to us. Our children that comes in our circle of, of friends or families or church, these are our children that God has given us to, to encourage. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. Lord God, we thank you this morning for the reminder to what 